Welcome to Between Data and Risk podcast. Today we'll be discussing data strategy, its elements, and ways of developing one. To present us with practical aspects of data strategy building, we've invited Harish Kumar, an experienced CDO, CIO, and general data strategist. Stay tuned. If you're a business owner or senior manager, you probably had more than enough about all the wonderful opportunities awaiting you in the era of digitalization. Whether it is big data, cloud, data science, or whatever buzzword is currently trendy. If you would like to hear someone dissecting these claims and showing you what it actually takes to improve business processes, you're in the right place. This is Between Data and Risk, where we discuss real life examples of what works and what doesn't in the world of business operations. Hi, I'm your friendly neighborhood data guy, Dr. Marian Siwiak, and with me is my co-host, Artur Buja, Cognition Shared Solutions Chief Risk and Strategy Officer. Hello. Welcome to this episode of Between Data and Risk. Today, we will be talking about data strategies, and we're excited to have with us our guest, Harish Kumar, an experienced CDO slash CIO and general data and IT strategist who agreed to share his experience with us. Hello, Harish. Hi, both. Uh, it's between data and risk. I feel like I'm between a hard uh, place and a rock. So <laughs> excited to be here. I will be the rock. I'm the usually <laughs> the bad cop. Uh, I will not. I will not probably um, spoil too much beans if I will tell that I had a chance to work with Harish previously. Uh, Harish created an amazing data environment that I was uh, happy to use, and I'm really excited to have him with, uh, with us today. Uh, his vision was was compelling and implementation uh, flawless, I would say, uh, because I'm a very nice guy. Uh, <laughs> I was supposed to be a bad cop. Uh, anyway, Harish, we want to talk about about data strategies. You, you, on your LinkedIn page, you describe yourself as a data strategist, and as I said, firsthand, I've seen that you have a vision for, for, for data strategy and uh, creating a data environment. I remember our discussions about self-serve environments and your desire to mm -hmm. enable uh, data science, analytics, and use of data. But let's start for our listeners, like, what is a data strategy? I know that there are, it's a hot topic and a buzzword. I would like our listeners to, to understand what, is there any value behind it or is it just another marketing buzzword? like? You as a data strategist, tell us what are the elements of the of the data strategy? What is it? Why somebody needs one? The floor is yeah. yours, sir. See, for me, uh, data strategy has always uh, existed. Okay, it's just that based on the buzz buzzwords, it's uh, evolved over time, right? So back in the day when the buzzword was everything around the data warehousing, uh, the data strategy was all around data warehousing. Then came the concepts of data privacy and GDPR and stuff, and uh, especially during the 2008 uh, situation, which included risk and uh, privacy and protection and so forth, the data strategy evolved to drive those things. Then came the disruption, which was uh, big data, uh, wherein more amount of data available in the cloud, creating more levels of availability, created a new style of uh, data strategy that came through. And eventually, because of the technological advancements, whatever came in as data science, and I have my own opinions around what we mean by data science and AI and so forth. So yeah, I can see a lot of smiling faces. I'm sure you have yours as well. Uh, so the data strategy over time has evolved, starting from being a very IT, traditional IT uh, kind of environment into uh, getting into the nitty gritties of how we use data and what impact uh, it makes, and eventually into how do we use this particular data much better. For me, uh, over the time I have felt and experienced uh, these things, I started being a data strategist uh, by creating data as a service to begin with. And in today's world, we should really start looking at data as a product overall, wherein how do you use this particular product, which is uh, fully packaged with all the necessary uh, safety and regulatory and legal precautions taken and place it in a supermarket in such a way that our product placement makes it usable and consumable to the end users. In the end, 
uh, we are thinking about a strategy which makes data as uh, ubiquitous or, or as commoditized as uh, coffee or as sugar that you go to the supermarket, pick it off the shelf and use it the way you want to use it and generate uh, the experiences of a simple coffee. You can then create a coffee uh, chai latte or a coffee latte or a cappuccino and so on and so forth using the ingredients concepts of data as a product. Yeah. So that's kind of the idea that I see us evolving into and defining strategies uh, in those terms. So strategy itself is not necessarily a buzzword, but buzzwords will impact and evolve strategies as we go forward. So from your experience, if somebody today wants to have a data strategy, they know that they have data, they underutilize it, and they've heard, okay, you need to have a data strategy yeah, to ensure that it will be used safely and efficiently. Like what what such a person would start with like you know they they have no data strategy in place they i don't know hire you as a, a cdo what are your first steps in creating a data strategy see one of the major things people do and as soon as we talk about strategy and especially uh, the larger companies do is get a consulting company involved who talk about industry benchmarks against what different companies have done in that particular industry towards data. But I think that's a wrong place to start with. Uh, the place starts internally. So we need to look at uh, both the technical maturity as well as the cultural maturity of the, uh, the particular organization you're dealing with based on which you can actually define the data strategy. There's a lot of places where you will not have foundationals in place. Okay, So think about something like Clean data, okay. Although clean data is probably an oxymoron, uh, I don't <laughs> think uh, data will ever be clean. U unicorn, I would say. It's... Yeah. <laughs> so, but it is very critical to have some level of cleanliness or the understanding of the quality of data, mm -hmm. which is foundational. People don't do it. They just say, "I have tons of data available in ADLS, uh, in a data lake somewhere." do something with it. I want a strategy to use it. Okay, mm -hmm. so first step is to make sure that you understand the foundations, baseline the foundations as to where you are. And on top of that, build a trajectory or a growth path in terms of how you will mature yourself as a data-driven organization and company. Now, when I talk about the cultural aspects of it, it's exactly the same. How do you do decision making in your company today? Mm -hmm. Okay. By and large, everybody still does uh, decision making based on intuitions. Mm -hmm. Well informed, misinformed, uh, whatever be the case, the decisions are still made uh, based on intuitions. And unfortunately, all the data strategies, no matter what kind of data strategy you build, if uh, the culture is very strongly oriented towards these kind of decision making at the leadership level, data will be used to substantiate your decision rather than drive to it. drive it exactly. Oh, but, but so this, this, me, is, this is very this 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 this, this is uh, kind of I couldn't agree with mo more with 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 what you're saying because as a uh, looking looking at risk strategies, which are kind of my my specialty, if if I if I were to go into, into a company, I would also start not with defining what a risk strategy is, but I would look at the, the, the company's culture, maturity, uh, processes, and, and start building it up from, from, from there. But with data, it's, uh, there, there's, there's, I think, a slight crucial difference which we, we, sh we, should, we should point out, because uh, risk management is, is something that people always do it's it's kind of behind the scenes and the, the the point is to bring it out data is something that's very visible to to people and uh, again you could you could argue that people do some sort of data strategy without even realizing it but everyone will do something completely different and and how how do you then bring it together so that uh, you know you don't you don't end up with one one size fits no one uh, solution should you should you define it top down or should you uh, kind of def have 
start with different data strategies and try to align them for different different teams, different right. departments. No, I think uh, if I look at it as an organization, each organization will have its own unique data strategy, but the building blocks for that data strategy would likely be the same. The building blocks meaning as part of a framework, I need data governance to be in place. I need uh, data quality to be in place. I need uh, uh, the data integration and the engineering capabilities to be in place. And then I need to figure out how I build in the operations of data to be in place, right? I will not touch data science at this particular point in time because data science may or may not be an add-on based on the data strategy that uh, people work with, okay? Now, these are all the building blocks, but how exactly these blocks are built and how exactly we progress depends on the organization and where they are when they start. Those building blocks may be smaller to begin with or larger in scale to begin with, again, depending on where the organization starts, where we are picking it up from, okay? Uh, we have all these data maturity models which go from, uh, uh, okay, we have to do descriptive to uh, predictive to prescriptive to all of those things. For me, those data maturity models do not uh, talk about the underlying requirements of what is foundational in terms of using data the right way. I must, uh, I must, I must agree with with Harish. I know that being a self proclaimed data scientist, um, I should maybe you know say that data science is first and foremost. However, from the from my experience, uh, working with with Harish was uh, really a, a pleasure because I had an environment that allowed me uh, to. To do some data science. Most of the times where we enter the, the, the company and they have data, some files in Excel on some uh, unconnected drive there, some files on Lake there, some files in data warehouse there. Uh, it's a nightmare and I am not spending my time as a data scientist. I'm spending my time as a data engineer, data architect. Uh, so if you hire a data scientist, before you hired your data architect, your data engineers, and before you developed your uh, data strategy, you're wasting data scientist's time. Actually, you're underutilizing him because he is unable to do data science without data availability. So as a data scientist, I completely agree. Like, don't, don't start thinking with data science. Data science may or may not be useful for you. You may derive a lot of value from data without data science. So Absolutely. this is this is this is something that I really want to 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 to, to underline that uh, yeah. data and strategy is critical. Gripe, yeah, and a common gripe that I've always had is uh, we almost often end up hiring data scientists to do a data engineer's job, and they suck at it. Okay. Similarly, because we we cannot compete in the market against uh, the uh, very data savvy companies or the late new companies that they are, like the Ubers of the world, the Airbnbs of the world and stuff, we end up getting uh, hit by situations where we have to hire anybody who has a certificate, who under who knows how to code in Python and understands uh, uh, what algorithm to use for a time series forecasting versus a uh, a pattern recognition problem and so forth, and just we pull them in without really getting the flavor of what data science really means, right? Eventually, what happens for us, uh, especially coming into the data science world, is that uh, end of the day, we start with the right intentions to say, I want to scientifically use data to produce an outcome, okay? What uh, ends up happening is that I want to figure out what story can I tell with this particular data that matches my intuition. This yeah. is this is critical, so, uh, Harish. I, I, it's it's rarely that somebody says this loud and clear, and and, and I love it. It's uh, most of the decisions as a biological beings we make decisions unconsciously. There is a research yeah. showing that you make decisions long before you realize that you made them and what your brain did in this split second between making a decision and 
you saying it is justifying it. And this is a very biological thing. If we want to make companies data-driven, yeah. we need to have at least uh, courage to say this is how the things naturally happen. Yeah. And what we expect of, of managers is to actually break their biology and st make a step back from, from, from their uh, subconsciousness or at least give them, give them time to feed their subconsciousness with more data so, so, so it can maybe, maybe operate differently. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So but unfortunately, what's happening is that we are simply translating our biases mm -hmm. into scientific terminology mm -hmm. and not into scientific methods to mm -hmm. solve a problem. Okay. So we'll call out our biases and say, okay, this is the hypothesis that I have. Prove or disprove it. And more likely than not, you will tend to prove it because you're just uh, bias oh, towards it. I, I, you I, just I, sprinkle a liberal uh, spray of uh, data science terminology, and then there you have it. It's a data-driven decision. I, I remember. I, I remember in one company, my team produced a result showing. I think I spoke about it in the podcast, even uh, showing that the tool that was used is actually counterproductive in the company, and uh, the head who ordered the analysis of efficiency came back and said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not taking it. I, it's produced me something different, something that will actually support my, because I, I, you know, I'm a sponsor, I support it and I'm, I'm not accepting this result. Just provide me something that will show how, how efficient we are. It's like, mm, this is how efficient you are. Uh, yeah. you, you, you should change, rather change something in your works than try to change something in our works. But this is this yeah. is something that literally happened to me when we showed that the tool uh, communication tool is counterproductive and is scaring clients away. The head of the tool uh, came to us and demanded uh, that we change the analysis because she doesn't like the result. Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, what we could probably conclude is that uh, a data strategy is often extremely dependent on the organization's culture to make decisions it's so, one yeah. thing but it should but you drive this culture it should it should start with what what is the culture it should identify the weak points and try to to to, to drive it into a better place in the ideal world we're we're talking about the fairy tales unicorns and in a very, data. exactly so in a very scientific world you can drive things but cultures don't get driven cultures evolve so they, there is an inherent need and a baggage that a culture carries which has to evolve over time. There will be disruptions that happen which trigger uh, the speed of the evolution, but some of those things are already kind of defined. Uh, we, in a previous episode, we spoke with a, with a fine gentleman who said that we spoke about innovation labs and turning, turning uh, let's say, products digital and, and creating digital products to support uh, the business processes. And he said, if you as a head of digital lab or uh, in his understanding, digital lab is something that, 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 that uh, really translates data into new, new, new users. And if you say that you have something disruptive, you're gone, you're dead, you're dead in the water. You, you just, you, you, you can leave the company. Everybody will hate you and they will just stop you. Uh, just don't disrupt, support, evolve, disrupt. What I meant by, by driving, I was meaning putting a little push into the evolution because from my experience, yeah. the evolution as a biologist, it goes a random way and it goes, you know, finds the, 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 the least resistance. Uh, sometimes it needs to be directed evolution. You need to have ability to... to, 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 to... Yeah, there, there have been important events in history when you had the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution those create these kind of changes uh, is there a data revolution happening right now i'm not so sure okay there is still a uh, it's still making most of what we have today rather than building capabilities of the future okay so the industrial revolution was all around building capabilities for the future mm -hmm. uh, irrespective of whether we know how we use it uh, today or not so I'm not very sure if uh, there is another revolution in the offing which could drive your evolution to the next stage. But maybe this is the time when the, the things come together for the revolution to happen. 
And no, there's if, a lot of. If, uh, uh, if you had uh, if you had such a a, a data revolution, because I, I really love the concept and it 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 kind of I think it sparks a lot a lot in the imagination. Uh, how would how would you uh, kind of see a data revolution happen potentially in in, in the future? If uh, you no, know, is it something that we should be driving for? So essentially, it needs to have the attributes of uh, virality, right? wherein it's not just one person talking about it or a couple of people talking about it amongst friends and so forth, but it needs to be demanded by people. It needs to come through from each individual saying, I want the sugar. Okay. So the whole uh, thing with, uh, I mean, I can come back to sugar or things like this because I think about everything as commoditization. Mm -hmm. If you make everything ubiquitous, people will ask for it or will take take it as a given that it is always already available and i'm going to use it at all times okay back in the day large corporates nobody ever used uh, computers computers were limited to certain people who were doing data entry jobs today as a cio when i come in uh, data entry job is the least of my problem even uh, people who probably are doing field sales and field work, want a laptop which is high spec, which, is, which has the best in class uh, uh, features and everything else. So it's because they are demanding, the technology is also improving and uh, we also have uh, things like uh, uh, the Riverside and everything else where we are able to have those kind of conversations and so forth because of the demand that we created. So if such a revolution needs to happen, more and more people have to get into this kind of a uh, demand statement. Today, what happens is their demand is limited to seeing reports at the end of the month. So it, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's very interesting what you say, because say a, a, a few episodes ago, we spoke to Dr. Sue Tripathi from Accenture. And, and the, one of the topics mm -hmm. that we mentioned was the, if we were talking about AI. We were talking about how AI, because it, it, it shouldn't be reserved for the few kind of practitioners. It should be, re, it should be actually for the users. Should, users should be, should, should be educated by what, what it's capable of, what it's not capable of, how to use it safely. Uh, we, we talked about creating the ubiquitous language that will serve us to communicate effectively about this. It sounds to me like uh, you you have a similar idea about data that uh, on on a on a on a bit more basic level than AI, we should even be educating people about what data is, what it isn't, how to use it, and create this common language of talking about this, because we it seems like da data is all around us, but we still don't have this this communication ability to to effectively talk about what what where we can take it. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the strategies which included AI in my vision was called ubiquitous AI vision, right? Simply because AI has 200 different meanings to 300 different people, right? So for me, how do I commoditize it in a way? How do I make it uh, so taken for granted that when I click on the uh, switch, I expect the light uh, to go there, on. right? Uh, if I open a tap, I expect the water to come through, right? How do I make AI so ubiquitous? Probably one of the things is to look at it a different way around. Three things that we can in influence is around products, people, and processes. Okay, A lot of times we start with people. Okay? Maybe we start with processes and say, I will embed AI within the process itself so that for anybody, it's uh, just turn on the switch and it turns on and the operating system just works. But inside, I have done all the coding and everything for or to make the operating system efficient, to make the uh, software work better, and so on and so forth. So maybe that is where we, if we focus, a lot of things would become uh, like taken uh, for granted, right? So that is where I see us focusing more. And eventually, creating everything as a product, which then ensures that people can consume it. You also have to make that consumable to people in a way. 
Right? If data is built in those consumable parts, cleanly packaged, uh, making it uh, more convenient for people to access, making it kind uh, of uh, giving them the level of trust that when you eat this, you will get supreme satisfaction or something of that sort. That's but probably isn't, what we isn't it exactly the danger? Because we 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 uh, we spoke with with uh, as we mentioned with with Dr. Tripathi, and first she she started the whole um, episode exactly talking about this lack of common understanding of of AI, and uh, it was. Uh, almost five minutes of explaining uh, details, how it differs for, for, for every person, every business, every, every domain. But what you said is, uh, what, what is my big worry and seeing, let's say, the direction of, of, of data science is, I love your comparison to sugar, mm, more even than the coffee, uh, because sugar is highly addictive substance, highly dangerous yeah. substance, highly uh, pleasant to take substance and uh, people are not aware they may have that it's unhealthy but they don't check how much sugar they get if you compare i don't know american products to to to, to, to european ones usually uh, something that bears the same name and the same package will have much higher sugar content and uh, obesity there is a big problem i am very uh afraid of uh, rogue analytics of uh, misuse of data and this is my worry that making this so ubiquitous it will be like making sugar just being everywhere it gives you know taste it makes people gives people this high as you just said so i have something that really makes me feel good but here we get to to to, to the very topic that you that you picked biases it's like I'm yeah. looking for this high to, to, to feel that my bias is better than others. Uh, how do we balance between making data really available and, and, and useful and not making it, you know, get people uh, high on their biases and, and, and just push their... their... It's, I think uh, when you start thinking about everything as a product, you will see that there are certain things that you can and you cannot manage okay and if you highly regularize data you have its pros and cons okay and if you completely deregularize it you have its pros and cons as well okay so just like let's talk about calling it as common language right so let's say common language language was created to communicate okay mm -hmm. but if you look at how language is used today and look at the amount of trolls that you would have on twitter or on any of your outcomes and so on and so forth, or the abusive language people use, it all comes from the same need of communication. Mm -hmm. It was the intent when certain things start is always good, okay? But good or evil is not because of the language or not because of uh, uh, the figure, particular yes. product, but how it is being used. And you'll always have these kind of elements in there, and that is where probably utter comes around risk to say how do we manage that as a risk anything that goes uh, uh, beyond recognition and similarly for ai as well right so when ai achieves a level of general intelligence what will we be doing right uh, so what what kind of changes could we expect those kind of all things are there which is the risk we put more data earlier if all data was on paper physically present, uh, locked in uh, silos and stuff where people did not have access. People who needed access also did not have access or made it very painful for them to have access. Now, once you digitize it, it is more prone to risk, right? Because you can't control all elements that act on your network. Okay, there no, will be zero-day vulnerabilities and everything. I'm, 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 so I'm speaking about a very specific, the specific, very specific risk. I'm not talking about, you know, emergence of some new risks. I am talking about the risk that, 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 that I think is at the very ground of, of, of many others, which mm -hmm. is misusing and the data. And specifically not cyber risk, right? Not, we're not talking about No, 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 we are, not, we are not talking about cyber yeah. risk. I'm, I'm talking about the misuse of data to, feed, to feed, feed, feed the biases. This is something like 
Can the strategy, can, can you can you imagine elements of strategy that would somehow, I don't know, put more emphasis on education or, I don't know, make it, I, I've heard about, I don't know, analysis uh, certificates. So you have a data team that if you prepare an analysis it, before you spread it out, you need to present it to, 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 to for certification. Like there are... There are ways around. Yeah. I'm just asking about your opinion. No, how, how, how would you, uh, what elements of data strategy would you uh, advise to, to, to our listeners to include in their data strategy to, to prevent, because making data available is, I believe, good. But as I said, as with sugar, I'm not saying we should ban sugar, but yeah. uh, everybody who is using sugar should be highly aware of uh, dangers behind seemingly innocent and pleasant substance yeah so uh, what i could uh, suggest uh, is something that i have uh, used in the past which is around helping people understand data quality okay mm -hmm. and uh, the kind of data that they are using in more simplistic terms think about when you go go online search for a particular product and then you get onto an Amazon page, there are multiple merchants selling the same product. Mm -hmm. But you would choose something which is a 4.5 rated or a 5 rated over a 2 rated uh, uh, merchant, right? So we devised building, breaking down all of our data quality elements that we look for, right? in terms of, let's say, canonicalization, standardization of data, missing data, uh, data with huge skewness, and so on and so forth, break it down into simple rating systems, okay? which allows people to think about, OK, this is a four-star data. This is a five-star rated data. Hence, I would be more conducive to use this. Now, eventually, the success of that particular data also depends on the amount of usage that happens. And data which is of bad quality, by definition itself, will go up. As more and more people use good quality data, by definition, the demand for good quality data will be more. And there will be less incentive for us to produce bad quality data. Now, in terms of the usage and the biases that come in, uh, the additional thing that you would have to do is think about the outcomes because the biases are present at the outcomes. Although the biases are inherently subconsciously put in throughout the entire process of data collection during to manipulation, right? Look at the biases at the outcome level to see if it has inclusivity, it has uh, the right kind of accountability of the entire end-to-end -end process and so on and so on. And that's where your data governance comes in play, which needs these additional kind of tooling that requires. Today, in the industry, we don't have tools or solutions like this, which make uh, ratifying data simpler, right? Which gives us a standard set of rules uh, that you could use to determine the quality of data. Okay. Again, quality by definition is subjective. What's great quality to me may not necessarily be good quality to you. So how do we remove those kind of things and make it more objective? So objectifying will help us reduce some of these biases in the final outcome, but we still have to understand on the final outcome what kind of biases are already. But I think it's the uh, it's the kind of uh, un almost unpredictable in uh, nature of, of of data that that and many people are uncomfortable here. And I think comfort is is very important thing because people are uh, comfortable seeing a report because they can they they feel they have uh, control over the data when the data is visualized on a page. And it doesn't actually drive anything unless they do something in it. I, I love your your uh, comparison to a to a you know switch uh, that you mentioned earlier on. If I if I turn on this, a switch, the light will go on, and that's 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 something I'm comfortable with. But with data, very often, and especially you mentioned that the kind of progression from descriptive to predictive to prescriptive systems. You know, the problem is that sometimes 
with data, you turn on the switch. Most of the time, will uh, the light will go on. Sometimes it will go on and it will be blue instead of white. But once in a while, I turn on the switch and my fish aquarium will boil. Uh, and uh, you know how how do I uh, how how do I make people comfortable that that I have control over the data as uh, you know I, I put myself in a in a kind of mindset of a, of a chief chief data officer although that's Marion's uh, job. No, uh, no, it's Harish's. I'm I'm data science guy. It's a <laughs> but this is the, the, the okay. this is the distinction that we discussed in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, so so no, in, in your job, how, how do you make people comfortable that? you have control and the, 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 you know, the fish are safe and uh, it, will, it will be there, there are there, the risks that you mentioned are actually managed. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm very glad how the questions are taking me from one strategy step to another strategy building block and so on and so forth. Okay, because especially for this is where we call out who we call as data evangelists. Okay, essentially, End of the day, people don't trust non-living things. Okay. People trust people. Okay. If there is somebody who gives you an assurance to say that this particular thing will work fine without your uh, image going grainy and so on and so forth, you will trust him that this system will work. Okay. But if you go in uh, from day one, I don't think I will trust my headphones to be working perfectly well. So that is where we bring in the concept of data translators and data evangelists who actually understand the system, understand the data, and give people the level of assurance that by using this particular data, it means that you will be able to do these things of additional value. Okay? Those are the kind of people that you will require, depending on the maturity of your organization, to drive this thing. Sometimes a lot of all the new organizations that we have. Uh, startups and the unicorns, they already come with this kind of uh, understanding. But uh, uh, old uh, conglomerates and uh, people like those, they still need the hand-holding because they are very used to getting a printout with the exact red, the exact green, and the exact yellow. And anything changes in those, even the color tones, they will throw the printer out and buy a new one. Okay. So that is the level at which people trust a particular system. So you will need certain level of evangelization before you can actually liberate. It's just like a religion, right? So not all religions, uh, without going too deep into it, uh, every religion does not uh, happen by itself. There is certain level of evangelism that needs to be done for people to understand what you're saying and then uh, kind of start following it. If I remember correctly, it was Zaratustra who managed to convert one guy. I think it was his wife's brother. And <laughs> it took a couple hundred years before Zaratustrianism actually built as a, as, a, as, a, as a religion which was capable of endangering yeah. then Christendom, if I remember correctly. Uh, but again, this... Um, so you have this data, data maturity, let's say, and evangelist building trust. Uh, is there any data maturity model that you prefer? Like, how do you evaluate data maturity? Like, you enter a new organization, and sometimes the situation is obvious. Like, they have laptops and they have some files on these on these laptops, and they say, "Yes, let's do data science or let's do the data environment." And sometimes, like, okay, they have already some data lakes, they have some data warehouses, they they have data team or six. How do you, uh, let's say? Do you have any, any any formal model or do you have like your own? Like if I am a CEO or, or, or senior manager and I'm looking at my organization, everybody has a laptop. How mature really am I in my, in my data journey? No, see, that's the absolute problem, right? So everything that we try to do, uh, there's a, a part science and part art in all of this, right? So if you, if you look at... Uh, having to get a standard maturity model and so on and so forth, you can slice and dice it into many different ways. But for me, when we think about data, the ultimate maturity is when you only use data to make your decision, period. Whether you have one Excel based on which you always make your decisions or you have 
petabyte scale of data uh, to which you make that one decision that is where uh, i feel is the ultimate maturity okay where you make uh, use data to make decisions irrespective of the size quality color nature of data and if the, those decisions are continuously successful then you are a data driven organization and a mature data driven organization outside of that if you for me if i just take decision making aside and say decision making is always going to be intuitive then i would say as an organization you should have one kpi for at an individual level that that particular individual needs to work on influence control and drive okay if you okay. are able to generate through data that one kpi for that particular individual to drive then you are a mature organization can you give us an example of such kpi organization. how do how, how sure. do you defi uh, define so think think about um, let's say a facilities manager okay mm -hmm. what is the job of a particular facilities manager his uh, his job would probably be to make sure that the user experience in uh, facility the organization in the, in the within the facility is top notch right mm -hmm. and we gave them a particular objective to say that your uh, net promoter score for the lack of a better term okay mm -hmm. should be at least 8 or more now how do you define that 8 or more what kind of survey results you use what kind of specific instances during his things that you use are all data points and mm -hmm. he needs to only focus on that particular data point as part of his work to say this is how i'm incentivized to grow okay now he can bring in innovation as part of his job innovation does not necessarily have to be digital it can mm -hmm. be in physical terms as well how does he make it faster how does he service the toilets faster or whatever uh, how does he optimize on his uh, uh, number of janitors that he needs to use or the kind of equipment he is using so on and so forth is all up to him and based on that how does he create the perception of success in his particular role okay it's all actually, defines this particular number we we had a Can discussion you get mm -hmm. somebody till there uh, is the question we had we had a discussion couple of times it's uh what you what you measure is what you get like if you make your measurement yeah. a target people start hacking like if you have a good measurement and you make it a target very often you it stops being a good measure we use the the example of 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 of, of uh, um, call, call call centers so how do you um i understand that there needs to be an kpi Mm, but do you have an idea of how? Because it, it was something that we that we that we that we a bit struggled in in defining and finding a good answer for is. So you have this measure, let's say this guy's NPS, um, that's that's nice and dandy. But to help him, you could use think of using data how to measure his his work, but not not in a targeted way. Uh, do you have some advice how to structure the data or use of data or 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 for the lack of the better term data strategy so it provides both measurements and targets like measurements which are used to supplement the work and targets which are used for mm, yeah uh, i, I think know. there will be a constant need of iteration of measures okay okay as well as targets based on many environmental factors right so based on the kind and quality of uh, resources that you get in the market as it stands today okay? mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, the kind of jobs that are available in the market for these guys i mean i'm just taking job as an example but there could be mm -hmm. multiple factors external factors that affect it but over time uh, some of the measures become redundant okay mm -hmm. or irrelevant as time passes right because uh, think about a data science solution when you actually do it a lot of those things become a one off upgrade and then after that the marginal value that that particular solution generates targeting a particular measure is of no use because that measure is already optimized mm -hmm. so you would have to change that particular measure and hence the target uh, to optimize a different measure further 
across NAP and LNP. So there will always be an iterative need to change measures and target. There is always a chance of hacking measures mm-hmm. because again, once it becomes math, any math can be hacked. Mm-hmm. In my view, so you will have to constantly uh, uh, learn to live with it and also constantly test whether that particular measure is relevant, uh, is the right measure for the right uh, people, and so on and so forth. And, uh, make so, those changes. So I think the outcome here is that the data strategy needs to be a living thing that totally, uh, constantly adapts to the to the place where the organization is. It cannot be set once and then forgotten and left to kind of to rot in the corner. It has to be yeah. alive. So, so it's a combination. Okay, Some of them are foundational as part of data strategy. Okay, uh, Some of them uh, as part of strategy itself have to be iterative, especially in this world where there are technological disruptions happening everywhere. We need to be agile enough to adapt uh, to the new and uh, shiny stuff that comes through. Right. Um, we may or may not fail but uh, or succeed, but you should always have a scope and flexibility to try out new things as part of your strategy. But there's, some, there's something I need to ask you, because uh, you, you mentioned about maturity. Uh, uh, you consider uh, an organization to be mature if the decisions are based on data. Now, uh, there, there may be criticism of, of, of that, that it, such an organization would completely remove the human element and discount the value of intuition, the value of uh, insight, which cannot be codified. Uh, how would you kind of counter such su- such such a uh, um, human centric uh, um, opposition? Well, everything that we talk about has its pros and cons. Okay. A human-centric organization, we exactly know where uh, the issues are. We are not even able to measure the uh, degree of success or the degree of failure of any decisions that humans make. Okay, It's simply based on, oh, with the best decision was to actually be able to do uh, 4% growth for this company for this year. Because I've shown growth, it was successful probably we are losing a lot more in terms of market share or we probably lost lost something to a new disruptor which we are not even seeing because we are blindsided about it and so on or don't come through that particular decision had a particular uh, what do you say lifetime or a shelf life and then we measured it based on that short term gain and then we closed it out so we are not necessarily measuring the degree of success over time of that same decision and so forth. When it comes to data-driven decision making, those degrees of successes and measures can be measured, lessons learned, and then reapplied. That's essentially what we do with machine learning and uh, uh, feedback loops, right? And reapplied and used for better decision making further. The experiences that a person gains uh, and uh, the feedback loop that a particular person has becomes very subjective when there is a human in place. Now, will we get to that utopian world in the next five, six years? Maybe not, but uh, in the next 15 to 20 years, probably. Because as you talk about more technological advancements and more people wanting work-life balance and a lot of vacation time and so on and so forth. The This kind of situations are bound to happen where people will want to reduce the people dependency on getting job done. Okay, They will create more reliance on process and products going forward, which essentially means more uh, process automation and so on and so forth. So including data scientists, uh, I mean, who are not doing data science, but probably uh, data technicians, so to speak. All these jobs can be relatively, uh, what do you say, replaced by process automation. Nice. If, uh, there's already low-code, no-code solutions, even for Python and Julia, that are available right now. Why would I want to invest uh, hundreds and tons of money on one person who is who says, I have a better job in the FANG 
with TC, my TC is 250, 350 plus. Okay, I would rather go there or you compete against that kind of a price value. I would say I would rather invest that in making a long lasting solution. Okay, building out a particular platform which gives me eventually the same uh, work that I would I could get out of you, right? I mean, I would think that way. I'm not sure if everybody would do so, but I feel when more and more people think like this, that's when you'll get that revolution happening. Uh, it's also a topic that I think Arthur just wrote article about is uh, why don't we call data technicians data technicians? You're the first person, actually, we, we, we hear that uses the term that we thought we coined. Uh, so <laughs> yes, I, to I, 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 yeah. I, I totally, I totally agree that most of the so-called data science jobs are actual data technicians and they are highly replaceable. You have, uh, yeah. pilotless AI by H2O, you have Google, uh, yeah. you, you have ways to, to, to automate machine learning and tweaking and the ability to tweak some parameters is no longer the sexiest job on the market. Um, exactly. So this is what uh, I so uh, if uh, it, you know this 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 was all all very interesting and if if we if we bring it together I'm sure there are, there are quite a, a lot of uh, very interesting pointers about about for for managers to actually create a data strategy. Uh, thank you very much for for sharing those those insights with us. If people want to contact you about your ideas want to know more uh, how what is the best best way to reach you uh the best way to reach out is via linkedin okay so um, i usually am fairly regular uh, on linkedin although i may not post uh, as much because again i i nor don't necessarily recommend having a lot of communication and also the side uh, effect of having trolled on some of the very different or unique understanding that we may have. But yeah, I'm always open for a dialogue in terms of understanding and conversing with people, especially uh, in this area. For me, data is very exciting because if there is to be a revolution, then this is what could take us there. Uh, so let's, let's hope we're prepared for it and we kind of, we manage to drive it in the right direction so it doesn't get derailed by uh, you know, Marian's worst nightmare, which is rogue analytics. <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> uh, thanks again yeah. for, uh, for, for taking the time. This, uh, this, this was really interesting. I think this is, this is all we have time for. And uh, as usual, let's hope it was of you to someone. Thank you for listening. If you're interested in data strategy, please check out the Data Strategy Show, where Samir Sharma explores the relationship between data strategy and business strategy, talking to executives from across industry. As usual, the link to this reference will be available in the notes to the episode. Also, don't miss the next one, where we will be talking about building data communities. To discuss with us the practical aspect of the community, we've invited head community evangelist at, at scale and host of the Rabbit Jane Show podcast, Rabbit Jane. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or visit bdr.show to find out more about future episodes and guests. You can also check out cognition.llc for more information on Cognition Shared Solution, our services and other events hosted by us. For now, it's thank you from myself, your friendly neighborhood data guy, Dr. Marian Siwiak and my co-host, Artur Buja. Thank you.